It all started when I was just 10. The discovery of my beliefs, the discovery of my identity, and the discovery of my story. When I was a little kid, I went to school in the Dutch Caribbean island of Curaçao. Yep, it was a pretty cool place to grow up in. And despite it being a very small island, there were all types of traditions and cultures within it. So it was a beautiful sunny day in which I, being 10 at the time, was eating and indulging my cheesy and delicious arepa, which is famous in the Venezuelan cuisine. At the time, my Muslim friend approaches me and tells me, Tanya, what are you doing? And I'm like, eating? <laughs> she looks at me, she tells me, well, you cannot eat now since it's Ramadan, which is a month of fasting celebrated by all Muslims. And I respond, you mean I cannot continue eating my cheesy and delicious arepa? And there it was, the most innocent tear to fall from my eye. I stopped eating the arepa, not knowing why or what Ramadan even was. And I feared that whatever it meant, I could never have another cheesy, delicious arepa again. So I went home, and I told my mom the story. And she tells me that unlike my Muslim friend, I do not have to fast, as I am not a Muslim, but a Druze. And thinking that the, a Druze, not a Jew, I know they sound very similar. Now, thinking that the answer she gave me of me being a Druze would make everything clearer, it was actually the complete opposite. It was the beginning of many, many questions. The first being, what does it mean to be a Druze? Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, these Druze people, they sound so interesting and cool. They know how to travel and eat. Think about it. The Caribbean and the Repas, I want to join this clan. Well, I hate to break it up to you, but you can only be a Druze if you're born a Druze, which means that converting to the religion is not really possible. The Druze, they live exclusively in the mountains of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel. This religion originated 1,000 years ago as an offshoot of Shia Islam, which means that a lot of the Muslim practices are also followed by Druze individuals. However, the Druze strictly oppose mixed marriages, conversion, and they follow the belief of recarnation. The Druze have also their own holy book, known as the Book of Wisdom, or Al-Hikmah. But this book is not really understandable to the lay person. In fact, if I wanted to further understand this book and to further indulge in my religion, I would have to give up every aspect of my life, starting to dress from toe to head in a sort of a black dress and a white veil, as you can see in the picture behind me. And I will be addressed as a sheikha, which is a person who's fully committed to the religion. Now, it is important to mention that the Jews is a very secretive religion, that I belong to 80 to 90% of its followers who do not really know anything because we're not sheikhs or sheikhs, so we're not fully committed, except some basic stuff, which I will mention today. So within only two million Jews worldwide, here I am today, a Lebanese Jews woman who today will explain to you my way of living in this tiny but complex religion. So picture this, walls and religion. Let's take a moment to unite these two terms together. The Jews have created walls within their surroundings. Yes, walls, but not literally like the one Donald Trump is so excited to create. Rather, walls that create internal solidarity. Walls that act as a tool in preserving the community's entity. But to live behind the wall and to dive into religious ideals and practices might sound very unprogressive. I mean, doesn't it? It contradicts the idea of being liberal, of living without a limit, without burden, without a wall. However, what if I tell you that I, being a liberal, a feminist, and a critical individual, have chosen to simultaneously straddle the walls of my Jewish community and the outside world? But then again, what does it mean to be a Druze? Does it mean to provide utter loyalty? Loyalty. That is one word that will explain to you why I have chosen to straddle the walls of my Jewish community, despite my disbelief in many of the Jewish practices. 
I come from a very traditional and culturally oriented family who believed that in order to be a good Jews, you must follow its ideals and practices, primarily the one of exogamy, which I'll explain to you in a minute later. But to be loyal, it's not only about following rules and obligations. It's also about creating a sense of connection, a sense of community, isn't it? For instance, wherever we would go in the world, my family will always try to find other Jewish communities to interact with. And yes, of course, as a minority, you want to preserve that identity. But also because no one really knows what's happening. I mean, it's so secretive that they need a reminder here and there of what their values stand for. But then again, what does it mean to be a Jew? Does it mean to sacrifice? Sacrifice is a term that we're subconsciously taught when being brought up in a Jewish community. The Jews have preserved their identity and their beliefs and their existence because of sacrifice. They would win battles even when outnumbered by the enemy. Think about it, two million Jews worldwide, that is not a lot. How would they do that? Well, sacrifice would be inspired by two other ideas. One is asabiyya which is a term that aims in protecting the community and creates internal solidarity. And two, is because of the idea of recognition, in which the soul of the muwahid would be transferred to the soul of another individual, and this creates a sense of kinship. This cements social relationship between Jews and individuals. But now, let's talk about marriage. It will teach you and me a little bit more about sacrifice, if you know what I mean. Now... <laughs> Marriage is a vital topic in the Druze community. I mean, George Clooney, who got married to Amal Amal Eddin, who, by the way, is a Druze, was the topic of the year. And despite them being my favorite couple, there was this augmented fear that spread throughout the Druze community that mixed marriages will continue to be inspired. This fear has always existed and remains one of the most prominent aspects in preserving the community's entity. And if a Druze individual participates in mixed marriages, then they will be neglected, neglected by the community and they would lose a lot of respect. So I guess this leaves the compulsion of each Druze individual to make a choice of either living behind the wall or outside the wall. No pressure, right? <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that if I'm willing to follow these obligations and these rules, I would have to give up on the free choice of love and the free choice of marrying whomever I want to marry. Yes, this is sad and all, but don't worry. I did my homework now. <laughs> there is only <laughs> two million Jews worldwide, right? And according to my very good friend, the internet, a person meets 10,000 individuals in his or her life. Isn't that true? Well, so according to my calculations, I'll bump into the ideal Druze man. Um, never, oh yeah, as you can see, never. So for all the hopeless romantic Druze out there, I feel you should create a sort of a Tinder Druze app. Yes, it will be the smallest app ever because your target audience will not exceed two million people, but it will solve a lot of the Druze problems. So if you ever thought that modern dating was tough, then try searching for the right partner in the Druze community. That is a challenge. But then again, what does it mean to be a Druze? Does it mean to protect? Protection, yeah. Protection is a value that we carry with us everywhere we go as Druze individuals. For instance, now, now I live in Europe. Previously, I've lived in Venezuela, and Panama, in different areas of Latin America, and the Dutch Caribbean. And in all of these areas, I've protected their community. I've indulged in their culture and their society. It is because of a protection that I make the choice of today understanding the words of my religion, despite having moments where I feel a massive disattachment from it. Being a Druze is also part of, it's basically a free choice. No one really is compelled to pray or fast. However, one aspect that is a matter of compulsion is the status that a Druze person is born into. A Druze remains Druze from birth till death, even if they wish to suspend religious practices. As Middle Eastern anthropologist Fuad al Khuri once said, to be a Druze goes far beyond holding a particular religious status. In actuality, it is a way of life, a cultural phenomenon, a complex structure of norms, a normative manual of deeds, and a moral code of existence. So as I have stated before, 
The Druze has a compulsion of either making a choice of living behind the wall or outside the wall. However, I have chosen to straddle the walls of my Druze community to further understand this cultural phenomenon and this way of life as Fa'at states. Growing up in different environments has taught me how culture has a specific way or of impacting the way as we as we human beings view the world around us. And perhaps if I expose myself to two different realities, I would perceive the world in a more profound way. I recently got asked, if you are as liberal as you think you are, then why don't you create reforms in your culture instead of conforming to them? This got me thinking of how reform is a tricky process. I personally believe that we can push society forward in many ways. One is by, of course, changing things in it, and the other is by sustaining tradition and culture. This also got me thinking of another question. How do we recreate reforms in cultures and traditions without harming or destroying the existence of the religion itself? I guess that is a dispute in itself. Nevertheless, I'm always trying to make choices that do not undermine my role as a woman in society. And when it comes to tradition and culture, that is one of the biggest challenges. And the values that I've mentioned today, the values of protection, the values of sacrifice, no matter how embedded they are in my identity, they are always being questioned. There are days that I wake up and I question all of my surroundings. I mean, to define yourself in a certain image that you've been taught to respect is beyond your control as it controls your self-consciousness, which is always alternating. It is basically not easy to sustain a definite image of yourself in a world that is constantly changing. It is not easy making choices today that will impact your world tomorrow. Perhaps one day, I will raise the Druze in the, my Druze children as today I'm raised, and perhaps not. Before being 10, I literally knew nothing about what it meant to be a Druze. Now, I'm 20 years old. I'm still shaping my identity. I'm still shaping my story. I'm still navigating my beliefs. And after all, I've discovered that we can be both progressive and respectful of religion and culture all at once. And I've discovered how, within its thousands of years of existence, my religion has learned to be, preserve itself by living behind a wall. And all I know is that I seek to continue to be part of these progresses by uniting my cultural upbringing and my own self-distinctive formation. Also, throughout all of these epiphanies, I realized that whatever it meant to be a Druze, my 10-year-old self should not worry. Because guess what? I could still have another cheesy and delicious arepa. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.